folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at this guy right here, Slaughterville. Uh, this is a game for one to six players where uh, it kind of just takes a whole bunch of different kinds of horror movies and smashes them in together. And uh, the characters are trying to fight off the evil people. And the evil people, of course, are trying to accomplish their nefarious deeds and so forth and so on. Kind of think of it as a cross between Dead of Winter, Light, and Last Night on Earth. Let's get down to the table and I'll show you. So in a game of Slaughterville, basically what is happening here is that uh, Slaughterville has been taken over by a uh, villainous band of evil people or things, and the players are characters that are stereotypical horror movie characters coming together to try to thwart the plans of the villain. Uh, there are basically 11 different locations in the game and you only use six of them, so there is a little bit of replayability there. Each location has its own deck of cards that will be encounter cards. Encounter cards have uh, anything like items, events, allies, uh, enhancements that boost your stats and that type of thing. Uh, and most of those in cards are going to ask you to pass some kind of test. In order to take those uh, tests that each deck is going to be throwing at you, each player is going to be using a number of different abilities uh, within the game. So here we have the Monster Hunter, and from top to bottom he has three combat, one agility, three nerve, three perception, and six health. Health being, of course, the number of hits that he can take before he dies. And then the other numbers, the 3, 1, 3, 3, those are the number of dice that he would be able to roll in order to uh, take a that kind of skill test. So in combat, he's going to be rolling three dice. Then at the bottom, you have two different kinds of abilities. That first sentence there is an inherent ability that he's always able to do. The second that has a... Uh, all capital title with a colon after the end of it and then an explanation. That is a special ability that can only be used if he discards a clue token. On the player's turn they can have they have two actions with which they can do three different things uh, either move, trade, or encounter the location's deck. So for example with the monster hunter being the first player here he's going to move let's say he'll go to the church and so while he's at the church, he has spent one move uh, action, so he has one more action left, he can encounter the church encounter deck. So basically the encounter deck is going to look, have cards that look similar to this in most cases. They'll have flavor test, text at the beginning. In this case, you decide to take a late night walk into the church. You see a priest placing something into the altar. He looks around nervously and then shuffles off to the back. You approach the altar. Make a perception check. If you succeed, you find the hidden compartment, attach ancient tome to gain plus one perception. All right, so in order to take this test, he would have to make a perception check and if he succeeds, he'll be able to take this tome and put it into his inventory, which would give him plus one perception in future checks. We look at the uh, perception of the Monster Hunter. It's a three. So he would take three dice and he would roll them, trying to get fives or sixes. Since he rolled two sixes, he succeeds in that, in that test. And so he attaches Ancient Tome to him and that gives him plus one perception on a future perception check. So then after the, the monster hunter, it would be the librarian's turn. The librarian decides to go to the antique store. The antique store turns over and she finds a tanto laying on the ground. So a tanto, a blade lies on the shelves, roll a 1d6. So she would have to roll a 1d6, that's a four. If you look down here at the bottom, it says a four through six. A ghost asks if you understand the significance of the sword. Make a perception check. If you succeed, you return it to its rightful owner. Find a clue. All right, so she would have to make a perception check. Her perception is uh, three dice. So she would roll three dice, trying to get a five or six. She does get a six. So she would find a clue. This would go into the discard pile of the location. She would take a clue token, 
During his turn, the bad boy went to the farm and was able to encounter the deck for free because it says that the, the uh, if a player is at a farm during his or her turn, he can encounter the farm once for a free action. So he did that, and then he was also able to, uh, which gave him a sickle, and then he also encountered uh, the search in the shed, and uh, he didn't actually find anything. He rolled a four. Now we're moving on to the spiritualist. She's going to go to the church uh, because the spiritualist is able to get plus one on all attributes while at the church uh, and then the villain suffers a negative one combat uh, at the church so if the cannibal rednecks ever come here they'll be minus one to their combat so uh, she m spent one action to move to the church she's going to spend one action to encounter the church and she finds an exorcism which is an event ally and uh, it says you pay the local clergy a visit to find help dealing with the trouble in Slaughterville. When you enter, there is a large gathering around the altar. You have walked into the middle of an exorcism. The priest asks for your help. You must fight the demon so that it can be removed from the victim. So now she has to fight the victim at a combat strength of four. So the demon's going to roll four dice while the spiritualist is going to normally be able to roll two dice because we're doing a combat but because we're at the church she gets a plus one to that so she gets to roll three dice so she rolls three dice and she gets one hit now the demon rolls and also gets one hit that is a wash now the character has a choice she can either try to leave combat which means she would have to make an agility check, rolling two dice, trying to get a five or a six. If she does, she goes away to an adjacent location. In this case, an adjacent location would be either the farm or the entrance to Slaughterville. But this case, the spiritualist is going to go ahead and keep going in the fight, and another round of combat begins. She rolls two hits, and the demon rolls only one hit. So, in this case, the spiritualist defeats the demon, and it says, "If you defeat the demon, attach exorcism to your uh, attach exorcism to gain plus one perception." All right, so um, that would be attached to her character, and now she has a perception of four um, instead of just a three. And for having defeated that demon in combat she would also get a clue token. So after all the characters have taken their turn, it, is then, it then becomes the villain's turn, and the villain is run by whoever is the first player. So in this instance, the monster hunter will actually carry out all of the actions that the uh, villains will do on their turn. Now each of the villains have different instructions on their cards. In this case, the cannibal rednecks, the first thing that they do is they roll a die and they go to that location. Uh, it's a random location. So uh, normally all of these would be in a row. Uh, so it would be one through six. So in this case, just because I'm trying to fit it into the camera, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So the cannibal pygmies would travel to the forest. And then they would look for any allies that are in the forest's discard pile. If there aren't any in the discard pile, then they would flip over cards from the deck until they do find one. So that's not one, not one, and here is an ally here. So the ally is a scout master. Now what would happen here is he would stay in the discard pile and now the cannibal pig, red, <laughs> and now the cannibal rednecks are going to stay here because at the beginning of their next turn, they're going to take him and capture him as one of their uh, end game conditions. And then, after that special action is carried out, uh, one of the cards is encountered at the actual uh, location. So it says, set the table. The cannibal rednecks may capture one ally from the discard pile of any location from which they have not already captured in an ally. Place that ally next to the villain starting area. Okay, so if there were any allies that they had not already captured, which in this case, um, there is an ally that is in a discard deck at a location that they have not captured one from yet, and it is the Scoutmaster. So they would automatically add this to their person, and now they are one up to winning. Then, first player token moves to the next person, and you go through that until one of the in-game conditions are met.
Whenever you fight the villain, this is their wounds. So you would be discarding cards uh, as, as well as these cards that are played out of the deck. So the characters would win if this deck is brought down to nothing. And the uh, villain wins if they accomplish their special win condition as set forth on their location card. And then some locations call for a final round of combat. You know, those uh, the very end of the movie where all of the good guys are fighting all of the bad guys and so forth and so on. But some of them do, some of them do not. So that is Slaughterville. Not a very heavy game, but a long game. And that's one of the things that really kind of surprised me because the rulebook is not very difficult. It's not very heavy at all. It's a very light game. There's only a few things that you can do on your turn. But... It elongates itself when you are reading the flavor text on the cards. Now, the caveat there is that you don't have to read the flavor text. You can just do whatever the card is asking you to do. You can play this game more quickly, uh, but you're, you're sacrificing some thematic flavor in order to do that. So just be aware that you can play it faster. It might not be as fun that way because it, it literally would just melt down to... Uh, flip a card, roll a die, flip a card, roll a die, oh, flip a card, roll a bunch of dice, and, and so forth and so on. So I would probably uh, say not to do that. Um, again, this goes from one to six players, and as with many games, not all, but as with many games, I would probably stay away from the five and six player count just because uh, with five or six people reading those flavor texts, the amount of time between your turn and your next turn is very high and there's a lot of downtime and sometimes that downtime is just boring because you don't really care what other people are doing. However, it is a cooperative game so maybe you do need to pay attention to what everybody else is doing. But one of the things that I really did like about it is that each scenario plays differently than the others. Um, there are There is a vanilla scenario that's uh, my, my my feeling was that the serial killer was the vanilla scenario and then everything else really has its own flavor to it. One scenario will be round based and you have a certain number of rounds to carry out and defeat the villain. Whereas other scenarios, um, there are no rounds to keep track of. It's just that when they meet their victory condition, then they've won. Or when you have met your victory condition, that you will have won. And the game is kind of open-ended in that way. So I did enjoy that. Um, each of the different uh, locations have their own little flavor to them as well, which I also enjoyed. Uh, I mentioned during the uh, setting that there are 11 uh, locations and you only use six at a time. So there's a lot of repayability with those different combinations that come up. So there's a lot of, uh, there's, there, there's kind of a play box feel with, that way um, with this game, which I also do enjoy. The artwork I thought was fine. And, and while it's not actual artwork I, <laughs> per se uh, with a uh, paint brush or a pencil or a pen, um, the photography in this game is good. It, it does capture a, the, the feeling that that location or that person was supposed to be. Now my problems with the game are, are quite simple. The downtime between player actions is too great. There's too much opportunity for you to be distracted from something else and have your attention drawn away from the game. And, and while you can forcibly make yourself uh, stay engaged, and that is you know, something that you probably should try to do, um, it's, it's unfair. Um, the, the game kind of relies upon you doing that rather than giving you a, an enriching experience that you want to do. Uh, that you want to stay engaged in. So another thing that I really just could not understand why they did it was the font and how small the text was on both of the cards and the locations. It was just a visually upsetting thing to have to read cards. Um, I, my eyesight is not getting any better and I was constantly having to lift my glasses in order to focus well on the different things. And I know I'm getting that way but I saw a lot of other people doing the same thing, having just having a difficult time reading the locations and the different cards and even the character abilities and those kinds of things. And to have that be a problem on such a reading heavy game, that's a difficult thing to overcome. So take that for what it's worth as well.
I wasn't incredibly impressed with it. I did have fun with it. My son actually really did enjoy it and has asked to play it repeatedly on, on, on uh, um, you know, day after day. So uh, he's my oldest. So uh, people will enjoy this game. I know that for a fact. It, it, it did successfully kickstart and so forth and so on. Um, it's probably just not my cup of tea. And if I'm going to play this kind of game, there are other games out there that I would much rather look to. So that is Slaughterville. We'll see you on the flip side, folks.